story was obviously puzzling. So it will be told again today, but with a completion that might make it easier for us to make the relationships between what the characters represent for us. But first of all, we have to go back to that question that's been asked of you all. What is the relationship between the auric field and this state of quiescence, this place where nothing is touched, really? It's just that presence, that attentiveness, or stillness and movement, if you want to bring it down to that. Many years ago, there was participation in a workshop, and after a period of meditation, one of the group was placed against a white wall, and they were asked to, with their thoughts, project an emotion, like think of something very sad, or think of something very happy, and then in the end to set, send light out to every, everything. And all of us who were participating in it were very clearly able to see her aura. And the changes that took place with the states of mind that she projected, which to me was irrefutable evidence of the effect that our minds, the energy that's put out by our minds is placed into the chemical field of our aura or our electromagnetic field. So we can then say, or looking at it from my own experience, that that auric field is a result of the chemistry, and the chemistry is a result of our thoughts. But there is something now in us that's not touched by our thoughts, that's there always. It has nothing to do with mind. It's that state of attention and presence that's there for us. Because it's the need to do, uh, the need to heal has all been stripped away. Now perhaps the story, which is in relation to this question, might make a little bit more sense to us with that little explanation. Let's see. It's a Tibetan story. A Tibetan story about three young boys. And they were called Jingmei, Wachap, and Dursang. Now, Jingmei was the son of a king. He was a prince and lived in a palace. And Wachap was the son of the richest merchant in all the city. So he also lived palatially, with a bevy of servants to take care of him. But Dursang was an orphan. He had no parents. He had no one. But despite the disparity <coughs> in the backgrounds, the three of them were very good friends. They played together every day. But one day Jingmei said, I'm sick of playing in the palace with all the toys and being entertained by all the courtiers. Uh, let's go out into the forest. So the other two boys readily agreed and off they went into the forest. Now as they were walking through, they noticed that there was a rocky outcrop with a ledge with a tree growing out from the top. And in the tree was the nest of a raven. So they said, oh, Let's make a game. Let's gather some stones and knock that raven's nest down. Well, they went off and they all gathered rocks in their robes until their pockets were full. Then they came back and then Jigme said to them, Now look, let's make this more than a game. Let's make an oath. Let's make an oath that we are not going to leave this forest until we knock down that nest. So, Jingmei said, I make this oath that I'm not going to go back to my palace until I knock down this nest. And then Wachup said, yes, and I make an oath too that I'm not going to go back to my 
house until we knocked down that nest, and so did Dessa. So they started pelting the nest with rocks, but they couldn't budge it. A few little twigs came falling down, and after a few hours, Ting Mei said, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this. My oath doesn't mean anything. I'm the I'm the son of a king. Oaths come and go for me. I don't I don't have any truck with that. He said, I'm going home. So off he went. But Wacha said, I'm staying. I'm going to keep my oath, as did Dursan. So for several more hours they kept pelting the nest with rocks. But they could not knock it down. Well, it was getting to be dusk, and Wachup said, Oh, what that silly old oath. My servants will be worried about me. They'll be look, coming out to look for where I am. I'm going to go home. Silly old oath, anyway. So Wachup was about to leave, and Dursang said, Well, you know, Jing Mei is the son of a king and it's easy for him. He has a palace and oaths really don't have any great purpose in his life. And you, the son of the richest merchant in town, have a bevy of servants who care for you. So you don't have to be concerned about promises and such. But I'm all alone. I have no one. All I have is my word. I'm going to stay here until I knock that nest down. So Dursan kept throwing stones until his arm was about to fall off. By this time it was almost night time. So he sat down to think what he could do. When suddenly, from behind the tree, from out of a little aperture that the boys had not noticed, came an old man with a long white beard, and with surprising agility he clambered down the side of the rock face, grabbed Dursang by the neck and threw him on the ground and three times knocked his head against the ground until Dursang was breathless. And the old man said, I've put up with your shenanigans all day, you three nasty boys throwing stones. He said, I'm Nagarjuna, I'm a hermit, and I've lived in that cave for the last 20 years, and never have I been disturbed by three nasty boys. But then all of a sudden his tone changed, and he looked at Dursan and he said, Oh, you're young able-bodied soul, you may be able to help me. If you do, we have the possibility to save many thousands of people. Are you willing? And Ersan readily agreed, I will do whatever it is that you tell me to do. So, Nagarjuna said, now listen very carefully. This is very important. <coughs> he said, I'm going to give you three things. This little parcel of food. He said, the container is very small, but you only require a very small amount of this food to be completely satisfied and filled with strength. And here, this axe. And then he gave Dursang a sack with a string tied around its top. And he said, you take these three things and you follow a path through the forest until you come to the very fringe of the forest where you see a large cemetery. I said, listen, I said, you must go into that cemetery 
and you must call for a spirit. His name is New Duck Dorje. And when you call his name, all the spirits and ghosts around will say, It's me, I'm New Duck Dorje. But be careful, because the real New Duck Dorje will be quiet. He will try to hide. But you see him. He'll try to run up the tree to get away from you. But when he climbs the tree and you demand that he gets down, you threaten to chop down his tree with your axe. And when he hears this, he'll try to clamber down and run away. And that's when you'll catch him and put him in this sack and tie it with the stream. And then you bring it back to me, because I have the power to change this ghost into a large nugget of gold. And with this gold, we'll be able to save many, many people. Can you do it? Will you do it? He said to Dursley. Yes, said Dursley. I will do it. But Nagarjuna said, now listen very, very carefully. This is the most important and the hardest thing to do. After you catch Noda Doji, you are not to say one word. Now he's very wily. He'll try all his ruses to make you speak. But if you utter just one word, the string of the sack will open and he'll fly back to the cemetery. Can you do it? He said, and Dursak said, yes, I will do it. Now there's more stories that come from this story, perhaps to be told or not to be told. That remains to be seen. But in relation to this question, what's the relationship between our auric field, that electromagnetic force field that's suffused with our energy, and that energy is the result of our thoughts. And that field is that which relates to life, that interacts with all of existence. And that stillness, that which is ever present for us, with attention, <coughs> nothing else, no thought, no projection, no desire, stillness, and movement, how do they interact? How does this story have impact on our possibility of answering this question? Look to the characters in the story as well as the details of what it said and what they represent for us.